in the 1990s, the liberal world order was expansionist. It was getting everyone on board. There was a lot of confidence and feeling in the air, and you could travel everywhere for the first time, you know, post-Soviet countries, seeing everyone uh, come on board. And now after 2016 is when that mentality really started to change among the establishment liberals. They became uh, you know, much harsher, much, much sterner. You, know, you have to sign up to this ideology. You have to show your commitment to it. You know, being a conservative is not acceptable. You have to denounce Trump. Like they became, yeah. they, they released their inner um, really political sense. And so now the tables have kind of turned and it's easy to understand that French conservatives and Hungarian conservatives and American conservatives have a sense of their own national interest. That's you, you can understand it and you can relate to it. And the liberal slash globalist commitment is just becoming more and more ideological. People really can't relate to it. It's mm -hmm. more something that you it's like, uh, you know, you, you have to to show your colors in order to gain access to elite institutions. But if we survey the world as a whole for an increasing number of countries, those are not the guiding assumption. So I think it's a very propitious time for those collaborations. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment. And this week, it's just me. Uh, we had to get a little bit nerdy today on the episode. And so I sent the, you know, mountain village idiot that I regularly tape this show with to go do something else. I'm kidding. Of course, Nick is in San Francisco, hanging out with our friends at the 1517 Fund uh, for some conference that they're doing out there. So uh, this week we had on uh, what feels like an extremely long overdue guest, um, someone who I am honored to call a friend and someone who is one of the first people to hear about what we were working on at American Moment. And we had on today, Dr. Gladden Pappen. Uh, he's known for, among many, many things, being one of the co-founders of both the Journal of American Greatness and American Affairs, but then subsequently uh, his professorship at the University of Dallas, um, a uh, fellowship at Matthias Corvinus Collegium, and now he is the incoming uh, president of the Hungarian Institute for Foreign Affairs. So he has made the full jump over uh, to our friends in Eastern Europe. Um, he's a native of St. Louis and received his AB in 2004 and his PhD in 2012 from Harvard University, where he was in his college days, also the editor of the Harvard Salient. In 2016, when he was a fellow at Notre Dame, he was the founding writer at the Journal of American Greatness blog, the precursor to American Affairs, which he subsequently co-founded with Julius Krein in 2017. Since then, American Affairs has been the home of Gladden's principal political writings on family policy, post-liberalism, and everything in between. And in 2021, he also co-founded the Post-Liberal Order Substack. Uh, since then, he's been a visiting senior fellow at the Matthias Corvinus Collegium in Budapest, on leave from the University of Dallas, where he's an associate professor of politics. And as I said, now he's going to be taking on a, a very senior role as basically one of the principal foreign policy thinkers in the country of Hungary, helping coordinate uh, a foreign policy that uh, is very different than most mainstream European powers would seek to pursue that is utterly unique to Hungary. And that is a lot of what we talk about in this episode is what is the unique, distinct approach to policy that Hungary has taken on every kind of issue. Uh, on domestic issues, it has squarely oriented everything that it does around the family. On foreign issues, it seeks sovereignty and independence above all. More importantly, it seeks broad-based prosperity for its people. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's a lot like the American Moment mission statement. We seek to implement public policy that supports strong families, a sovereign nation, and prosperity for all. And the other piece of that mission statement that's critical is the implement part. The reason Hungary is impressive is not actually the particulars of any one public policy that it's pursuing. It is because it is the rare example in all the world, and certainly in Western democracies, of durable, meaningfully center-right government. It is worth paying attention to for that reason alone. We go into all of the cool things that you should be paying attention to about it. I highly recommend that you follow Gladden on social media to keep an eye on everything that he's doing. I was a joy to tape with him, and we're actually going to be hosting an event with him shortly after here as well. Um, 
Thanks to him for coming on the show. Thanks to him for everything that he's done to build a thought ecosystem around these ideas. Uh, American Affairs is worth reading every issue. I'm actually working my way through the backlog right now. We had a fantastic discussion. I wish it could have gone for another hour, but we'll go now to Dr. Gladden Pappen. Dr. Pappen, thank you for coming on the podcast. Great to be here. Feels like it's a long time due. You keep on trapezing off to Europe for months and years at a time. And so we finally caught you. And uh, I think at a very opportune time, before we get to why uh, it's a particularly good time to uh, be taping with you, I would love to hear a little bit about how you ended up here because um, I've met many, you know, mild mannered Catholic academics over the years, and you're much more interesting than most of them. Uh, be very curious to hear the the journey that got you to the point where you are today. Well, I thought you meant that got me to this room, and I mm -hmm. immediately thought of uh, meeting you a couple of years ago, right as you were starting the organization. And uh, you know, right from the beginning, it just clicked with me as an idea. Um, you know, the importance of developing uh, staffers and talent um, that could serve in in Washington. So I'm very glad to to having seen you then a couple of years ago when it was still a, a nascent idea yeah. to, to being across the table. It was yeah. great. When it sounded like BS from a bunch of kids who didn't know what they were talking about. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, it's well, very real. So, um, we, went to, we got barbecue that day, actually, I believe. Um, yes, we did. spot in Dallas that we went to? Uh, slow bone. Slow yeah, bone. Slow bone. So, Check yeah, it out if yeah. you're in Dallas. <laughs> still, at the, yeah, still, still at the top of my Dallas barbecue list. Very good. Uh, which is really hard to replicate outside of Texas. But um, anyway, so yeah, I've been in uh, Budapest for the last two years, uh, you know, becoming in, in the next week or two, the president of the Hungarian Institute of Foreign Affairs. Um, but really, you know, I've been an academic uh, for the last, um, well, you know, 10, uh, 15 years. I um, you know, went to Harvard undergraduate, worked on the Harvard Salient with uh, the likes of Ross Douthat and and uh, our our merry band of warriors mm -hmm. between 2000 2004. I'm regularly uh, informed yeah. that you destroyed the Harvard Salient. Is that accurate? Uh, the Harvard <laughs> Salient is still around, actually, but yeah. uh, uh, so so whatever happened to it, it's it's <laughs> it's, it's come back. Yeah. Um, and then you know did my PhD at Harvard. I uh, worked at Notre Dame for four years uh, at the Center for Ethics and Culture there. And uh, then moved to Dallas, and from there to Budapest. So that's the that's the the short outline of the bio. So the institutions that you operated in for most of your career until now were, or until the last couple of years, were occupied by all sorts of different conservatives and many people who aren't conservatives at all. When was the first moment that you realized that you had a, a very different intellectual and policy perspective on all the relevant issues than most of the mainstream right? Uh, actually, from the beginning, um, I had a little bit of a, a, a different viewpoint. Um, and my father was uh, honestly a, a kind of a Buchananite in, in the late 1990s. And uh, so I you know, read a lot of read a lot of materials, and um, you know had 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 kind of a, a more traditionalist viewpoint. Um, and at that time, the debates in conservative circles were framed in terms of uh, neoconservatism versus uh, traditionalism, or everything else. And you had kind of the uh, traditionalists; they were kind of Kirkian was the was the vein there. Um, uh, with a mixture of other anti neoconservatives in the in the mix, paleo conservatives, paleo libertarians. So, um, got along with kind of the anti war libertarians much more much more in those days. So I was always kind of like a a skeptic of the uh, more globalist orientation that was already taking place. Um, you know, I wrote an op ed against the uh, Iraq invasion in two thousand three, um, right at the beginning, which you know, put me a, a, li yeah. a little bit at odds with uh, the the general mindset of, of conservatives at the time. And I think that's part of the reason why I didn't go immediately toward uh, more political things. I didn't, I didn't go to Washington to work. I wanted to study political philosophy because I really thought um, that it was important to understand the uh, foundations of modern politics. Mm -hmm. um, so I really threw myself into that, into the PhD program at Harvard with Harvey Mansfield, uh, who's still going. <laughs> so yeah, still going at 91 years. And like old. super lucid. I saw him speak yeah. a few months ago. I was like, that guy, I know 60 year olds that talk 
summer. Yeah, <laughs> Nin- 91 and yeah. just st- just stepping out of the classroom now. Yeah. Um, so that's part of why I went toward the toward the mm-hmm. political philosophy direction originally, just because um, you know I I had I had kind of a different perspective on on conservatism. Obviously, not all the elements of my own commitments now were uh, were set at the time, but um, you know I really wanted to look more more deeply into the heart of modern liberalism um, and the nature of modern politics. And I would just say that um, I think that those those inquiries and those sets of questions have become more relevant and more politically relevant uh, over time, particularly after 2016. Um, and as the as global politics shifted, as the expectations of the 1990s uh, liberal global order, or liberal imperium, I think we're calling it, um, you know, stopped playing out according to plan. Uh, I think all of that kind of began to come together more. But in the early days, I was I was uh, very much on the out, look, on on the outside looking in at uh, at early two thousands Republican politics. So one of the riffs that I have in my speeches a lot these days is that actually one of the limitations of the modern right in the United States is its over reliance on an academic temperament. Would you agree with that? Do you think that sometimes people abstract and philosophize public policy questions that should be much more practical, um, or do you disagree? That's a very good question, and um, and uh, uh, a bit of a hard one to answer. But I, th- I think maybe the 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 way to approach it, um, you know, is is considering that uh, you know, American politics on both left and right has been. Um, yeah, pretty ideologically driven. Um, it, there's a kind of left form of a uh, very philosophical a set of liberal commitments, and there's a right-wing version of a very philosophical uh, liberal commitments. Um, and, you know, on the right, that has played out, I think, in a direction that um, is sort of skeptical of the usefulness of government uh, and that it, I, I think that framework uh, works to the detriment of forming public policy um, in a practical manner. I think that's. I think we're still maybe speaking in in too abstract of a way. You know, what does it mean for policy to be, you know, practical versus theoretical or something? But um, the sort of assumptions that that people bring to politics matter a lot. And if your uh, if your assumptions are that you know the the purposes of government are are very limited and that you know human freedom and flourishing is you know only um, only blocked by governments and you know. Uh, and uh, human freedom and flourishing, you know, only comes through, um, you know, private enterprise, things like that. Those, there's, there, there are important forms of modern uh, philosophical commitments that that go into that. Um, so it does affect kind of the expectations that people have about public policy. Uh, it affects the expectations that uh, political actors have about government, and it affects the expectations um, and and commitments and, and structure of the conservative movement. Even going back to the 19th century, um, you know, people had the impression that in America, um, business was the more noble activity. You have visitors to the United States from uh, from Britain in the 19th century observing um, that public service didn't doesn't have the same um, you know, nobility and grandeur, like that the best talent sees a different field mm-hmm. um, of possibility and throws itself into business. So some of this is in the American DNA itself, um, whereas you know, in a building co- a country in, from scratch, yeah. right? Whereas in Asian countries, you know, being a civil servant is considered the highest order profession. Like it would, it would, it would carry a similar social cachet as say, being a doctor or a banker in the United States, like it is considered like the smartest kids go do that. And that obviously, that's not the case in the United States. In fact, quite the opposite. It's like, oh, you dirty bureaucrat. And that has consequences for all sorts of governance issues. Just a couple of weeks ago, I know we'll talk about Hungary stuff later, but you know, just a couple of weeks ago, um, I was having dinner with some some students who were involved with the Matthias Corvinus Collegium where I've been. Um, and I asked them like, you know, what's the impression that, that people have of um, you know, students who go into government service, like why is why is that uh, value? Because you know, in in America, the 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 business mindset is primary, and you know, the greatest accomplishments are like the um, you know startup champions and and things like that. And the and the, the very simple response I got was, oh, well, it's meritocratic, like it's very clearly a meritocratic system, um, and you know, they promote 
excellence and you know demote <laughs> your or don't don't promote you mm-hmm. uh, if you're not good and it ha- still so it still has that sense mm-hmm. um and i think you're right that um yeah that's just a different um there are a couple of different reasons a couple of reasons why america is different um but you know the situation i think clearly uh, as you were suggesting requires um you know a little bit of correction or a little bit of movement mm-hmm. um particularly by the conservative movement to um, inspire talent to you know come into uh, the political scene. So you were working on political philosophical questions, and then um, a very orange man uh, starts running for president. What was your first reaction, and what was the chain of events that led to you forming um, some of the institutions that um, we know and love today? Well, uh, yeah, my first reaction was like everyone else's kind of surprise and 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 shock. Like, is this is this real? Is this serious? Um, and the first thing that I noted about uh, Trump in in 2015, in the beginning of 2016, was that he kept a pretty clear line, um, and it had a had a fairly clear vision of of what he wanted. It was build the wall, you know, bring jobs back to America, um, you know. Uh, defend America better in in competition with China. Those were basically the uh, and bring the troops home, right? Mm-hmm. You know, stop the stop the insanity wars. Um, and those those were as those emerged in his campaign. I sort of thought like, well, you know, he's clearly a a funny guy to be a to be a political candidate, but um, there's something kind of serious in those commitments. And so um, Julius Krein and and Michael Anton. Uh, started this blog, Journal of American Greatness, in January, February of 2016. Yeah, I joined it right right at the beginning, and uh, you know th- that project was, um, as it said from the beginning, kind of a an ironic project. Everyone was talking about how ridiculous Trump was, so we decided to write in a, an ironic way, you know, about how extremely serious you know <laughs> this, this this set of commitments is, and. Um, you know, build out that this is the the most intellectual candidacy there's ever yeah. been. Yeah. Um, you know, precisely because it's the first one to identify, uh, you know, deindustrialization, open borders, climate challenge, the liberal imperium, as we're talking about. Um, so we wrote it in this wrote in this ironic vein, and that you know gradually became more serious over time. Um, so it was it was. Um, uh, you know, it started on a whim, you know, as a joke, mm-hmm. <laughs> as an experiment to see if we could, um, you know, build a kind of intellectual architecture. Uh, at the time, there was really absolutely nothing, mm-hmm. nothing there. Um, you know, National Review was 100 percent against, you know, against Trump. Um, and, you know, people weren't seeing that the campaign uh, or the po- they weren't seeing the political phenomenon and the background political issues. So although it started as kind of this, um, you know, funny effort to build an intellectual architecture around Trumpism, it morphed into something more serious, which was uh, the fact that there are fundamental political shifts happening that require combination of you know, new political analysis, economic analysis, um, you know, deeper intellectual understanding, cultural commentary. And, um, you know, it became impossible to to run JAG uh, from behind the pseudonyms because, you know, we were engaging in debates with real people and, you know, Peggy Noonan started citing it in the Wall Street Journal and we're getting like 50,000 views per day. And we thought, hey, you know, maybe there's a market for this. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we shut it down in, in summer of, of uh of 2016, then Anton, uh, you know, wrote the, wrote the famous Flight 93 article uh, for CRB, but you know, using his his pseudonym from uh, from JAG, and uh, then Julius and I started American Affairs in in spring of 2017, uh, and by that point, you know, you had the two great phenomena of 2016. Um, the election of Trump and Brexit, and between the two of those, it certainly looked uh, like that the liberal imperium, if you will, uh, was backfooted, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so it seemed like it was time to to create a venue for more serious analysis of that. My uh, history of sort of the begats here is that JAG had within it sort of a couple of different tendencies and um, those tendencies sort of speciated into into three different publications. 
you know, American greatness ended up fulfilling the role of sort of the the rank and file right wing publication that does news and opinion. The American mind scooped up, um, you know, sort of some of the dissident strains coming out of the tech world and like hyper online subcultures uh, while giving a platform for Straussians to be Straussians. Uh, and then uh, 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 American Affairs was like, we're going to be the the hardcore political economy, like what needs to be done with government uh, at a very practical, tactical level. Um, would you agree with that characterization of, of sort of how that all spun out or is that too cute by half? I think that's broadly correct. Um, what happened right when Journal of American Greatness was pulled, you know, we just pulled it one day from the internet, uh, immediately people started passing around like Samizdat copies of, you know, <laughs> Publius Decius Muse essays among, yeah. um, Straussian graduate students and policy yeah. people in DC and American Greatness came on the scene in order to be like the jag version of nro that's yeah. how i would that's how i would think of it mm -hmm. um because they just immediately put up a website in order to to capture the name like this will be the daily website that you can go mm -hmm. for some of those kind of perspectives mm -hmm. maybe less philosophical or whatever again more like jag inspired nro mm -hmm. um so i think that's right and um yeah i mean american affairs it's not it's not it's not about political economy in a limited way obviously most of what we publish ends up um, uh, addressing political economic questions, but I mean, I think of it as a as a magazine of public policy and political thought. Mm -hmm. um, you know, both of us have uh, political theory backgrounds, um, and you know, politics is the architectonic science, so it includes <laughs> economics within it. So, um, even though I'm not an economist, I can yeah. you know dip my toes into it. Uh, so I think that's right. And uh, again, it, it, there was something ironic to to us about the moment of 2016. How could there not be with Trump becoming president? Um, and it, 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 one way um, uh, that that manifested itself was it seemed that seemed to us, at least to me, that the um, we had this whole world of political publications, journals and so forth. Um, and they had all become more ideological, like they had become committed to um, sustaining the, the the vision or the image of the post Cold War uh, liberal order, um, and there wasn't a serious place to discuss it. Um, and we we were um, so we consciously made the choice to uh, have a print publication with basically no images in it whatsoever right kind That's of like, <laughs> kind of like a, a throwback to an earlier era of mm -hmm. journal um because after the after the satire and and sarcasm of of jag where else was there to go you know yeah. it, it was kind of the the completely orthogonal yeah. move um you know was to come out with this like door stopper you know co <laughs> coffee coffee table coffee table book um and uh, even the cover, it's like the titles of the articles vaguely separated into the three or four categories, blue text, blue lines. That's it. <laughs> it's, it's that's great. classic. That's <laughs> classic. That's that's what the cover of a journal should be. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, no, I mean, it in in some way, in some way, only having a kind of lighthearted attitude about the pretensions of the of the liberal order at the time um, enabled us, I think, to to try to create a venue where serious people on the left and the right um, could comment on it. When did you first start paying attention to Hungary? Uh, oh, uh, 2011, actually. I remember there was a, a New York Times article <clears throat> at the time that Hungary uh, passed its new constitution of 2011. I didn't really know much about the country at the time, but there was a panicked article in the New York Times saying, oh no, there's a new Hungarian constitution and they are invoking the idea of the crown of St. Stephen. And so I read it and this was of course before the word existed, but I was like, wow, that's based. And I was like, wow. So I sent to all my friends, um, I read the constitution and it's like, you know, invokes God and the Christian heritage of Hungary. And, uh, you know, we defend and support the family. And so I sent around the panicked New York Times article mm -hmm. to everyone and I was like, 
why can't we have a constitution like this? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, constitution's great, but like, look, look at this. Um, so I didn't really have much interaction with them for a while. Um, but as you may know, I've been interested in European politics for a long time, particularly because the nature of the right there is, is different. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, you know, for most of the last 30 years, really until, until the last five or six years, um, the liberal imperium, if you will, was successful in scaring American conservatives about um, the European right. Mm -hmm. You know, they demonized the French right. You have the cordon sanitaire. You can't, the Front National is horrible, Rassemblement National now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and many of these parties did have complex histories, but, um, you know, in the, in the modern period, the last 10 years or so, um, you know, we've seen a, a confident and capable right emerge in Europe that is different from the American right, more comfortable with government, more comfortable with, um, you know, seeking maybe a conservative, they call it social conservatism. In, in the United States, social conservatism means you know, anti-abortion, pro-family. Mm -hmm. um, in Europe, the social conservative tradition is about um, using the government to promote socially conservative ends, mm -hmm. uh, including through the formation of their uh, state support system. So I was always interested in that because I thought it was like orthogonal to American politics. Um, so I started dabbling in, in European stuff in uh, 2014, 2015. There were some small networks uh, that were trying to build a connection between American and European conservatives. So um, it was during that early time. Um, you know, the one I think once you had the uh, law and justice government start in Poland in 2015, 2016, that's when, uh, being a larger country, uh, some Americans started writing about um, the nature of Central European conservatism. And that would, and that would like have that. been the yeah. first identifiably conservative government in Europe in some time, right? Well, the second Orban government began in 2010. Okay. Um, but I think it, you know, 2015, 2016 is an important time period because from 2010 to, to 2015, uh, the fir the second and third Orban governments were trying to kind of right the ship of the Hungarian state in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. Well, and, and I, then I'm but, almost yeah. glad that 2015, 2016 happened later because it allowed them to, in a sort of quiet, diligent way without too much international attention, actually build what they needed to. Right. But then by that time, so it's so if it's December of 2016, you've got a conservative government uh, in um, you know, you have you've had Brexit, mm -hmm. and then you have conservative governments in Central Europe, and mm -hmm. you have Trump. So that to me, that's the period when the, um, you know, the I don't know collapse of the liberal imperium kind of began, mm -hmm. or the or the or the reaction of the liberal imperium to these challenges to it became even fiercer. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're, we're in a totally different world now with respect to cooperation between American and European conservatives. Um, that's this, the kind of relationships that, um, people I think take for granted today. Now where CPAC occurs on both sides, yeah. uh, where, you know, Europeans come and speak at heritage, things like that, um, that absolutely did not exist whatsoever 10 years ago. And it's really good to see. Why does that matter in very explicit terms? from a sociological perspective for both sides of the ledger? Why is it important for, let's say, Hungarians that they have American friends? And why is it important for Americans that they have Hungarian friends? Well, I think the idea of the 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 liberal internationalist idea with respect to conservative forces was divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. um, let's isolate them into um, different incommunicable categories. Mm -hmm. The French conservatives can't have nothing to talk about with the Hungarian conservatives. The Hungarian conservatives have nothing to talk about with the American conservatives. Um, and so fighting back against that is extremely important at the broad sense. That's the, that's really the sociological answer mm -hmm. to the question. I think there is now a deeper geopolitical answer to the question, um, which is what assumptions about human nature and politics are going to be important for countries to understand going forward. Mm -hmm. What we've seen in the last year is that the uh, that the liberal world order territorially and geographically seems to be getting smaller. Whatever set of events precipitated it, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Western reaction to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, other countries 
beginning to recalculate their position in the changing world order, the rise of China, whatever the causes are, we can talk about them uh, specifically. But the liberal world order is becoming smaller. It's becoming more isolationist, in effect. Uh, it wants to have uh, a stronger ideological commitment within it rather than a kind of confident practical extension abroad. So we're in, we're in a kind of strange situation now where it's conservatives and conservative countries that seem to be able to deal very practically, uh, even that that you could I, I wouldn't want to say that they're living the the 90s uh, the 90s dream of uh, multilateral engagements and so on and so forth. But there, there's something to that, like the in the 1990s, the liberal world order was expansionist. It was getting everyone on board. There was a lot of confidence and feeling in the air. You, know, you could travel everywhere for the first time, you know, post-Soviet countries, seeing everyone uh, come on board. And now af after 2016 is when that mentality really started to change among the establishment liberals. They became uh, you know, much harsher, much, much sterner. You, know, you have to sign up to this ideology. You have to show your commitment to it. You know, being a conservative is not acceptable. You have to denounce Trump. Like they became, yeah. they, they released their inner um, really political sense. And so now the tables have kind of turned and conservatives have the ability to say, well, yes, we, these are, we have different countries. There are different, uh, slight different varieties of conservative traditions and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, this is something that enables us to speak to one another rather than makes that more difficult. It's easy to understand that French conservatives and Hungarian conservatives and American conservatives have a sense of their own national interest. That's You, you can understand it and you can relate to it. And the liberal slash globalist commitment is just becoming more and more ideological. People really can't relate to it it's mm -hmm. more something that you it's like uh you know you you have to to show your colors in order to gain access to elite institutions but if we survey the world as a whole that's those are not the the guiding assumption and for an increasing number of countries those are not the guiding assumptions so i think it's a very propitious time for those collaborations and that it's 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 interesting because those liberal institutions seem to have bitten themselves when it comes to the social phenomena inside various countries over the last five to 10 years, because almost every single country that I can think of has at least one aspect of public policy that it has decided to engage in in recent years that is heretical to that liberal international consensus. I can't think of any uncomplicatedly liberal internationalist country anymore. Even right. the UK did Brexit, right? Um, the United States elected Trump. The Scandinavian countries are now quite immigration restrictionist, even from a center left perspective. France has its foreign policy uh, uh, you know, complications. Like every, the, the, It doesn't seem like there's much um, unanimity anymore and maybe there never was but when the anchoring values of the liberal international order was unanimity or is unanimity then that just causes everyone to break do you think that's right no, i think that's exactly right mm -hmm. in fact um they the end of history concept that that framework that at the end of history lies global liberalism, that was a very confident commitment. It was a belief that everyone is reaching the historical point at which the assumptions of global of liberalism will become the global norm. Mm -hmm. So what are those assumptions? Um, you know, everyone wants freedom as understood by mm -hmm. John Stuart Mill. Everyone wants liberal democracy as understood you know, in late stage Western European and American countries in exactly the same way, where the purpose of liberal democracy is to realize further and further um, the freedoms in this million framework. So mm -hmm. radical sexual freedom, departure from the, the hidebound traditions or from national customs, 
not having any unchosen obligations. They really believed that that was a point in in time, a framework that had been reached. And their language around that has already begun to shift. Now you start to hear uh, liberals say, well, in fact, we should realize that liberalism is such a precious, rare occurrence that it takes all of our effort <laughs> and all of our force to defend yeah. it. And and it's like, well, there's actually a paradigm shift between those two views. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you're exactly right. We're now in stage two where they realize, I mean, again, let's go back to the Iraq war. I mean, I... I I, remember, I posed it at the time in part because the assumptions that were going into it were that regime change would be super easy by military force because, you know, as George W. Bush said in his second inaugural address in 2005, you know, in the heart of every uh, human being lies this exact same desire for, you know, participatory um, uh, li liberal democracy. And you can think liberal democracy is a great thing, or you can think that other forms of democracy, like Christian democracy, are better. Be something closer to my view, and but but either way, obviously, it wasn't easy to spread liberal democracy by military force, mm. and that was uh, that was an assumption that had come out of the '90s. That again, well, we have to help other uh, countries come to this same realization that we have, and 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 they they have abandoned that view now, mm. in effect, uh, but they haven't stopped trying to enforce it so they're they're in effect they're kind of doubling down even more um you know they even even though the liberal imperium is shrinking they are becoming more serious about it domestically um or within the remaining sphere um, but as you pointed out yeah almost every country you know most recently uh macron had a kind of uh, you know declaration on his on his plane ride back back to Europe that that caused quite a stir. <laughs> um, but you have this, uh, you have more countries now beginning to discover their own sense of national strategy. And again, that's already something that, that begins to depart from the assumptions of the 90s. There are two common elements that I keep coming back to for places where we've won. The first is what seems like a very medium termist mindset. So not just what's going on in the next election and not a kind of wispy long-term attitude towards politics that that renders you sort of incapable of doing things in the there and now. It seems like the movements that have been successful have been sort of on the order of a couple decades of of durable um institution building of right-wing governments and efforts. And that at the center of those medium termist movements are often a single charismatic person. Um, I would think of Nigel Farage in the UK basically deciding 25 years ago that there will be Brexit and by hook or by crook making it happen. Um, I think Trump in his own way, like he was talking this way for decades and no one listened to him. And there's there's an argument there. But in Hungary, there seems to be an extremely obvious. I mean, in Israel, there's Netanyahu, and in, in India, there's Modi. I'm very interested in the the figure of Viktor Orban and what exactly him and his party have done over the last 20 to 25 years. Can you paint a sort of broad narrative of what they've achieved? Well, I think the goal is to have a stable, uh, conservative Christian country, and that does take being in government for a period of time um as they have been so the second orban government began in 2010 so he's when been, was the first orban government and this is exactly <laughs> what i'm coming to and i think this is this this is the key this is the the, the bottom line up front i think um well so he was a, a anti-communist activist in the 1980s um hungary went through a, a difficult post-communist transition like with many central european countries a lot of the state assets were sold off you know, basically auctioned, bought by Western European companies. Um, the didn't really go through a proper constitutional reform process. And then in the late 1990s, you had the expansion of NATO. So uh, Orban became prime minister in 1998 uh, for four years. And during that time, it was a little bit like um, it was maybe not a perfect analogy, but you know the the 
he, f- he realized that there were a lot of um, other forces in, in society, for example, like the media were entirely owned by foreign companies and were therefore working against him constantly. So uh, again, maybe it's a little bit like Trump first term, you know, um, when, you know, he came to power, his assumptions were, uh, were, were strong, but you know, his, is he realized that there was a lot that was set against him in the country uh, and outside of it. And so when he came to power the second time after socialist rule uh, in 2010, he came in with a much clearer vision of what he wanted to do um, and how to do it. So I think he took a more um, assertive view of the of the of the need of a conservative government to um you know help foster a a conservative society conservative culture um a media environment where conservatism could could flourish as well or at least where the playing field would be more level um you know when he came to power in in 2010 i think something on the order of like 80 percent of the media was was foreign owned um, I think today it's closer to 50, 50, or it's at least about 50, 50, uh, left wing and right, right wing media. Um, and I think you realize the importance of education and formation as well. The Matthias Corvinus Collegium, where I've been a visiting fellow for the last couple of years, uh, the institution has been around for about 25 years to try to cultivate, um, you know, after the change of regime in the 1990s to try to cultivate a, uh, the best talent in the nation and to, to foster it, encourage its patriotism and um, help serve the country in that manner. Um, but, you know, is it, it a college? What it, is it? Uh, yes, it, it is. Uh, it's a college, not in the U.S. sense. It's more in the, you know, Oxford sense of like it's a place where people live and go to other universities. Mm. But it's like uh, um, I like to say that it, it's it you know, it's like if ISI were like right in the middle of dc and had a gigantic building where all the students lived mm-hmm. and all the other universities were in dc as well and all yeah. the best people lived there you know that's basically what mm-hmm. um what mcc is but um certainly charismatic leader what i'm getting at though is that he has a very practical sense of what it takes to build a stable conservative society and he's tried to order the institutions in that manner so media at improve the national education system um, you know, foster the, you know, try to avoid brain drain, encourage the best talent to be able to find its path uh, in Hungary and to enc- con- encourage it in a manner broadly consistent with conservative values, not in terms of strict like ideological or political formation, but broadly. Um, and, you know, frankly, the, the government is very young. That to me is stands out as a big difference. Uh, between Hungary so and the United seem States. Like there's yeah. a lot of boomers. It seems like it's a lot of Gen X and millennials, right? Yeah, I mean uh, the you know, the the president is in her forties, the uh, minister of justice is in her forties, a lot of the other ministers are in their forties, the prime minister's political director is in his mid thirties. Yeah, and I think European politics is younger in general. I mean, Macron is pretty young, uh, Maloney, of course. So there's um, there's there's better turnover in European politics anyway, I think. Um, but you know, if 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 you if you if you make a critical list of the typical characteristics of uh, charismatic and transformative political leaders like the that they're not planning for the future that they're not concerned with those around them that they um you know hold everything extremely close you know to like a small set of buddies and don't expand the you know expand like if you th- think of those as like being typical characteristics of um you know strong and visionary political leaders i would say he doesn't have those characteristics mm-hmm. um that that at least in the in the country as a whole you know, you've seen a lot of the practical institution building outside of the state. Not it's not just state institutions, practical institution building outside of the state, um, and an encouragement of young people to be involved. So um it's fascinating because you know, people get into these abstract arguments in DC about exactly how much American conservatives can learn from Hungary and when they're talking about that, they're usually talking about this public policy proposal or that public policy proposal. Completely uninteresting to me, relative to 
the much more fascinating question of what seems to be the best example in a Western democracy of a sociological victory by the right, creating the mechanism by which you can form a cross-sector, durable, growing patriotic right-wing elite. That's a big deal. And it was actually, I, I remember that there's, there's a riff that you told me years ago now um, that ties into the, the brain drain question you mentioned that really crystallized this for me, which is that for any European country, period, but specifically Eastern European countries and specifically any of those countries that are trying to be sort of unpopularly right wing vis-a-vis -vis the global order, the hardest thing is people, is retaining and building that talent. Why is that? Why is it so difficult, historically speaking, for and in most cases, for them to keep that talent? Oh, that's a that's that's a good question. Um, I, in answering it, I I, I want to say that um, you know, Hungary has some unique country characteristics too that play a role here. Um, so, as important as good governance and good policy and good political strategy are. They have good material to work with, um, and that, just the fact that they said no to the migrant crisis, like that alone, is going to pay dividends. What I mean is decades. that there, there, are, there are historical reasons mm -hmm. for that too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a country at the crossroads of Europe. Uh, it's been ruled by outsiders before. You know, it was on the uh, got the short end of the stick in severe ways throughout the 20th century. So, you know, cu coming into the 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 mindset of people in the country is kind of skepticism and resistance to ideologies that would be un imposed on them from from outside. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot to work with. It wasn't as though it wasn't as though it's, you know, the transformation of a, you know, decadent left wing <laughs> left liberal yeah. society. It's it's a different starting point and had a lot of good um a lot of good characteristics. But you're right though that brain drain is particularly a pos a, a problem um, in up and coming countries like Hungary, there's a lot of temptation to uh, go to Western Europe. You can make more money. I mean, mm -hmm. money is probably the simple answer to the question. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's a problem there too. People do, um, you know, people do work elsewhere, but they have very good, you know, connections with their, uh, with with those. Uh, and as the country becomes more successful, you're starting to see like a, a mutual fertilization, if, if you will. Like people go abroad, they bring their expertise, come back um and and share it so you know i don't think there's a like simple or or, or glib answer to your question but mm -hmm. it's um um but ultimately you're right it is it is all about people and institution building is about finding the right people developing them uh and giving them opportunity and at, at some level in american politics that will require you know you, know, you, you mentioned the boomers uh that will require in a loosening the the tight grip on uh positions and institutions and I've given and, up on the idea yeah. that they're going to do it willingly they right, just have right, to right, die right. um <laughs> but uh yes uh that is obviously right and and of course the the unique question in the United States is there will be empirically at some point a generational change in the guard and the make the the thing to make sure is that that is not simply a fresh coat of paint on the same rusted out public policy ideas and intellectual framework, it's that it, you get a new car <laughs> with, right, with all right, sorts right. of stuff in it. Right. Um, so we've talked about the the sociology uh, and, the, and the sort of mechanics of what Orban was able to do, which is build these, these durable civil society institutions that uh, were able to make it much easier to sort of wield power. Um, but what did he want to do with it? What's the sort of ideological framework that Hungarian elites on the right of center and, and Orban specifically have chosen to guide the country with i think it's uh uh god homeland and family is the is the slogan and um it's it's allowing the um traditions of the hungarian nation to flourish in a successful way in a complex modern environment so it's uh it's not it's not really the the imposition of an ideology um, in the way that liberals would describe it critically, um, and also not in the way that, yeah, not not in the way that uh, like a, a harsh version of uh, you know right wing p 
power might imagine it as yeah. well. I mean, again, this is not a trad cat theocracy. No, <laughs> no. Um, but again, like these, these are these are uh, these are um, uh, uh, bo- boogeyman anyway, right? Mm-hmm. Like these are not. That's not a real, um, not a real concept or not a real problem, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're pursuing good Christian conservative government that protects the family mm-hmm. and um, allows freedom in the country, encourages people to do what they want, um, but within the context that the the that the norms that are guiding society are um, those that have been essential to the Hungarian identity for the last thousand years. So um, it's always different when you're talking about European countries because they have their they have their specific nations and they have um, a specific identity that's been built up over time. So there are specific specific things and characteristics uh, that one can make reference to. So um, you know, for Hungary. Its identity as a nation includes Christianity. That's an essential defining feature. It's not just an it's not just an option. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Hungarian crown was, uh, you know, in, incorporated through the relationship between the Pope um, and Saint Stephen. And that is that when they brought the Hungarian crown back into the Parliament building, um, that was a kind of symbol that. Uh, of the essence of Hungarian sovereignty is its commitment to Christianity. So it's not the same as like a, a secularist separation of, of church and state as you see in, in Western Europe or even in, in some way in the United States. It's more of a connection and a, it's a distinction, but a connection and, and a correlation. So, um, you know, protecting its Christian identity, there would be no Hungarian nation without Christianity. So the state and the churches have a positive, you know, collaborative role, uh, protection of the family, making making the family the norm. Again, it's a free country. You can do what you want. Um, but the norm is set by the reality of what the family is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think those are the those are the elements, obviously, plus a strong sense of, of national independence um, and a desire to uh, be able to to make their way in the world. They were ruled by outside powers for a very long time, uh, and really the only came into view as a as a country that was back on its own two feet, trying to chart its own course in the last ten or twelve years. So, the part of this that is always the funniest when people are trying to accuse it of being this like religiously particularistic autocracy is that it's a country with deep Catholic heritage that is ruled by Cal- Calvinists right now. <laughs> like Victor Orban himself is not a Catholic is my understanding. Right. And it's just it 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 it's it's just hilarious the way that people um you know project their own neuroses um thinking about Ann Applebaum here onto a, right, a country right, right. um that they don't they don't understand at all. Yeah, um, I mean it 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 has uh you know a handful of core uh Christian communities it's probably you know historically you know three quarters catholic and a quarter you know reformed and evangelical which means lutheran um and yeah i mean it has a it, each of those plays a particular role in hungarian public life for example there's a strong positive relationship between the churches and the education system uh there's a you know strong number of uh, religious parochial catholic schools mm-hmm. um and even a, a requirement for uh, ethical education within the public schools where the curriculum can be chosen according to your religious background. Mm. Um, people often make, yeah, I mean, people often point out that um, church attendance is not that high in, in Hungary. It's not as high as it is maybe in, in Poland, for example, where it, where it's still quite high. But it's an essential part of the identity. Um, and when President uh, Katalin Novak was in uh, New York, a at the beginning of March, she was talking about this, and she said, um, "You know, there are specific parts of the the Christian mindset, the you know, finding the proper relationship between the individual and the community. Um, you know, caring for the for the poor and the weak. You know, it's not a Christianity doesn't want a society of um, you know strong men, a kind of, or it doesn't have a um, it doesn't have a, a a goal of you know the 
radical unequal superiority of the tech elite mm. or something like that um so these the we we take the christian commitments for granted i think because all of western civilization is so formed by them mm-hmm. um but they are particular and and distinctive um and they shape society even when uh it, they shape society in a cultural way even if um mass attendance numbers you know fluctuate and, and go up and down so it is really core to the the country's identity i think one of the public policy areas that people tend to focus most on when it comes to the sort of practical upshot of that Christian orientation in public life in Hungary is what can be called broadly family policy. What what's the 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 smorgasbord of stuff that Hungary's tried and and succeeded in doing uh, over the last decade, and and what's your broad assessment of how effective it's been? Well, let's step back from that with just one half one half one step. Um, and point out that a lot of people are talking about family policy now, which was not the case a few years ago. I mean, Elon Musk was on Tucker Carlson the other night, you know, talking about the birth dearth. Um, a lot of people sense that this is a problem now, a lot of different governments. Mm-hmm. And Hungary happens to have sensed it early and because of the favorable conditions of its government and its conservative commitments, it uh, sought to address it. So, you know, uh, because of the ravages of communism and the difficulties of the 20th century, the Hungarian population was declining and its birth rate falling every single year from the mid 1970s until, well, really 2010 in the beginning of the beginning of the second Orban government. So the the fundamental thing that they did is try to make the benefit to the family a condition of all of their legislation. So to bring into the legislative process through having a kind of para ministry devoted to analyzing the subject try to evaluate what the consequences are for the family as a unit um, of legislation that's made in the country and if i had to name one thing that's most important to do in thinking about the policy framework around family policy that's what family policy is you know it's like policy in the broad broad sense is this idea of a framework we're going to we're going to look at things from the from the standpoint of how they affect the family hungary also had the there are no social issues everything's a social issue right 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 and um and you know we're not just looking at marginal tax rates for unmarried individuals but you know we're analyzing everything through the lens of um you know having the goal of promoting and enabling family formation so they also had the ability though which is a little bit different from the united states because we have um you know, policy is somewhat path dependent. So we already have uh, the uh, great society based welfare programs mm-hmm. in a particular way. So it, it, we can't tear down our system and, and build it from scratch. They were able to build a system uh, around the family. So um, most of their benefit programs are are tied to family structure and are, are provided uh, two families with the goal of encouraging marriage and encouraging home ownership. So, you know, even even though family policy has become like a, a big thing to talk about, it wasn't just about birth rates, right. which is a little bit of a weird discussion anyway. Yeah. I always kind of I've I've never framed family policy just around birth rates, but um and that's important but people because like it's to a talk about it. thing to do even if it, your birth rate doesn't change. Right, like, right, right. It can't just be. It can't just be evaluated on. Yeah. Um, it can't just be evaluated on that standpoint. But um, you know, when you step off the jet bridge at uh, the Budapest airport, you walk through. Step off the plane at the jet bridge. You walk through the jet bridge, and it's got those signs that say "Welcome to Family Friendly Hungary." And you're like, "Well, in American jet bridges, it's like credit card advertisements, <laughs> you know? and, and like, uh, and on the subways, it's like prescription drug trials I, and things I, like that." I got so, off the plane at LAX a couple of weeks ago, and you have to take uh, a shuttle to where your Uber picks you up, and the biggest, most obvious billboard by far is for a personal injury law firm that will sue Uber on your behalf to get Amazing. you money. It's Amazing. like, yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Welcome yeah. to Los right, Angeles. Right, right, right. <laughs> Welcome to a very litigious society, yeah. Yeah. a very litigious American society. So they want they want, uh, they want want people to feel materially, mm-hmm. like they want to feel the, the reality that they will be better off mm-hmm. and not 
engaging in an existential risk mm-hmm. um, if they marry and if they have a mm-hmm. child. So, you know, the tools that are that are used in that, you know, we can talk about them at, at another time. They, the, you know, they're quite detailed. But basically, it's financial incentives around uh, building homes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, getting, in, get, yeah, getting, getting into home. Um, so, you know, they give you, a a a, a loan basically, um, when you, uh, marry mm-hmm. and decide to have children and it's progressively forgivable. Um, it's a loan toward, um, you know, the building a house or renovating an existing one. Uh, and it's progressively forgivable based on the number of children you have. That's mm-hmm. one part of the system. Um, there also is a is a system around what we would call basically paid family leave, mm-hmm. and um, to just to give you a really quick picture of what that what that looks like, you know, and it is tied to prior work. So if you're a woman and you have been working um, and you have a child, you will receive for about half a year after that, um, while you're staying at home taking care of the child. 100% of your prior salary, provided that you've been working for, I think, a couple of years, um, and not pay personal income tax on that. So you will actually have more, yeah. right? So you'll actually have more money in the immediate aftermath, right? So that you, just so that you don't have to worry about that, um, that, that calculation. And then, um, then, uh, and then women, uh, also have a, uh, a beneficial tax so the families have a beneficial tax regime based on the number of children they have mm-hmm. so you have a flat personal income tax in hungary it's 15 mm-hmm. percent. there's social security type tax on top of that but your personal income tax is flat at 15 percent, uh, and that's reduced by a third based mm-hmm. on the number of children you have for the for one primary care uh, primary earner in the household mm-hmm. um and then a woman who has a fourth child will never pay income tax again in the rest of her life um so those are those and are is the, that for the family or just her that income? one is for her okay um and then uh you so know does that mean that the sort of implicit encouragement is to have lots of children and also work so that you can yes. have tax-free income okay yeah um now it it yes it, the, the the encouragement is it's it's um I mean, they call it a kind of workfare system. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, the the chief welfare-like benefit, the chief state financial benefit, is through the family policy. Mm-hmm. Um, and to have act, I mean, I guess you can think of it uh, in two ways. Um, it is an encouragement to women in the workforce mm-hmm. to have a child, mm-hmm. and it's also an encouragement to work. I mean, you have to have. You have to have worked in order to get the benefit, but really, in in modern society, men and women are in the workforce, mm-hmm. and so it's not like it's not like all right, well, you know, let's force people back into the, back into the workforce. It's like people are in the workforce. Well, how do we, how do how do we make it financially viable for them, um, you know, to have the child that they want to have? You know, it's it's so interesting, right? Because I, I think a core mindset issue that um, a lot of our friends in the American right might have is that there can be a kind of um, Luddism um, or, or sort of um, a, 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 a sort of uncomplicated, uh, less than thoughtful wish that things would just go back to the way they were. And what is impressive about so much of what Hungary does and, and the cutting edge of what's being thought in that theme is how do you recognize the realities of the modern world and try to stitch together something resembling a conservative society from that starting point. Right. And so exactly. The practical reality that comes to mind immediately when I when I think of what you just laid out is that historically um people would have children much earlier. They'd be having them at 18, 19, 20. Um and so in that system, maybe this policy is not strictly speaking necessary, but if women are going to be in the workforce for a few years anyway, 21, 22, 23, what you don't want or what you want to balance against is path dependency on continuing to work for very long past child rearing years. This balances the scales in favor of temporarily leaving the workforce, having children and building a family in a way that doesn't exist in the United States. And let's talk about one of the drivers 
behind that really behind why women stay in the workforce longer of course there's um you know the general environment of modern society where mm. people want to work people want to earn money mm -hmm. but there are also student loans right and people bear a lot of burden from those in the united states we had a big battle over that um you know with the uh the announcements from the biden administration in august about their plans for uh, suspending student loan repayments temporarily, mm -hmm. things like that. And if you looked at most of the conservative commentary, it was it was like, well, uh, you know, well, you you shouldn't have taken out the loans if you're not willing to repay it. And just like typical kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, boomer esque. Well, you know, we worked hard to pay off our loans, so mm -hmm. you should be able to work harder to pay off yeah. your loan. Well, the biology is a real matter, and as you say. Um, the time that people get married will determine the age at which people get married um, will determine how many children they have overall in hungary the and until the end of 2022 uh, a woman who had student loan outstanding student loan debts um, as she expects her first child those repayments are automatically suspended for three years upon having a second child they are cut in half the remaining balances halves and upon having a third child they're eliminated wow. now it's from the beginning of 2023 um the hungarian government introduced another policy for women who um have a child uh, within two years of the end of their uh, uh end of their university education and obtaining a degree um and the um, their student loan balance will be entirely forgiven. Wow. Now, the policy is probably not exactly translatable to the United States. It's Europe. These are pub, you know, mostly public universities. I'm the assuming student tuition's loan is much cheaper. Tuition's much cheaper. Yeah. I understand there are like all sorts what of about, different factors. What about but the it's role still... that college plays in Europe? Like, yeah. ha has it has it become this like Veblen good in the same way that it is in the United States, where you know the cultural script is you have to go to college, otherwise you're a dirty hick like does that exist in hungary in the same way um i mean th th they have excellent universities mm -hmm. and and i think for yeah any professional program you know, people people go to university people go to university in western europe mm -hmm. um and uh you know the there's certainly you don't have the the terrible situation of unemployment that you have in some of the um uh, some Western European countries where there, where youth unemployment is very high in Spain, for example, and mm. Italy. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a different, different situation and not exactly translatable, but again, what interests me more is the, the policymaking mindset. Um, you know, do we immediately react to the idea of student loan forgiveness with like, uh, a, a boomer paternalism or, maybe this is an interesting way to yeah it sounds cool <laughs> yeah like uh, you know again uh do we want to subsidize american universities in that way private universities that are charging enormous amounts for tuition like there are bigger structural problems yeah. probably in the american universities which is a completely separate discussion i don't have any brilliant ideas on how to, mm -hmm. how to reform it um but uh again the mind the mindset is different yeah has it worked for the fertility rate yeah um you know there are three metrics that three or even four metrics that i would point to um that are of interest one is the number of marriages per year it's the marriage rate uh the number of divorces per year so divorce rate uh the abortion rate number of abortions per year um and then the total fertility rate and um the number of marriages per year since the introduction of the family policies has doubled more than doubled wow. um and the number of divorces per year has halved wow. and so you know fertility itself is kind of a trailing indicator because it takes time you know for um for those numbers to change um but Hungary's had a very strong increase in its uh, total fertility rate each year since the introduction of these policies. Um, again, the most interesting one to me is I forgot to talk about abortion, but um, you know, without making um, 
abortion the the principal social issue that has not been the principal social issue uh the number of abortions per year i think is also fallen by a half or more something like that i have to check the exact number yeah. but by 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 a large amount um but i think the the interesting one is the the marriage number mm-hmm. um people get married when they feel good about their economic prospects when they feel that what is on the other side of that is a uh, possibility and they're hopeful about it mm-hmm. In America now, housing is extremely expensive. Um, you know, the boomers are not selling their properties; they're holding on to them for for dear life as their you know most valuable investment. So, um, you know, young people looking, uh, young people, of course, in America can move somewhere else, find cheaper housing, mm-hmm. but it is a problem. And or uh, they'll sell yeah. it to like a Saudi prince or whatever for you know six x what they paid for it and then go vacation for three years and leave nothing to their children <laughs> like that's right, the other right, alternative right, right. in the united states right exactly yeah. exactly so um right it's just a it's a it's a different situation and um you know look the economic situation in europe has been really bad for the last year uh inflation is super high mm-hmm. uh, particularly in this in the central european countries mm-hmm. uh these are you know hungry borders ukraine mm-hmm. and there's normally a lot of trade across that border and you know there's been a, a huge huge uh geoeconomic mm-hmm. division in europe um and so all the supply chains are having to recalibrate and things like that these are countries right next to um, a major major war so inflation has been bad um and um you know the the family policies will have to catch up to that over time as the as the fiscal abilities of the state increase mm-hmm. um but it is a hard time you know energy prices are going up so you know the situation is not as propitious anywhere in europe um you know for for young families starting out but still um it, everyone acknowledges that the, the that the birth dearth is a problem you know you th- think back to these um crazy uh like zero population growth people of uh 40 50 years ago remember them from they were still around in the 90s um but you know the the idea that um you know you need to have a growing society in order to have an economically vibrant society if you if the fertility rate falls very low uh below replacement level that doesn't mean it's zero population growth as a stable society what's really happening is society is just getting extremely old yeah. it's like be the same number of people just you know much much more tilted toward uh, toward old age so what does that economy look like it's sclerotic it's uh, focused exclusively on medical care um you know there's uh wage wages are are increasing which is contributing to inflation because there's a smaller number of young people whose services become ipso facto more valuable they're mm-hmm. having to serve the old of course we should serve the old they're wonderful but like that doesn't create a dynamic um right doesn't create a dynamic economy so if we want a, a dynamic economy it has to be a growing one it has to be a lot of young people um and everyone recognizes that it's just a matter of trying to figure out uh, what the best ways are to to promote that what will hungary choose geopolitically this decade uh, it's continued national independence um, and good cooperation with and connectivity with other countries. So Hungary is a small country, 10 million people, the middle of Central Europe. Um, it used to be uh, before World War I, uh, a, lar- a larger country with you know, access to ports and things like that. It's a landlocked country, happens to have the largest lake in central europe in the middle of it so it's very beautiful but you know, it's a landlocked country in the the middle of central europe and it has been you know caught between uh, competing powers a lot so it was under ottoman domination for a long time you know, the austrians um you know made it a part of the austrian empire as the ottomans were kicked out you know it it gained sort of a national independence within the austrian empire under the 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 dual monarchy and then the 20th century kind of smashed everything um and so the the baseline experience of the of the country is that it has been dominated by outside powers when those outside powers form blocks countries that are on the periphery of the blocks are in terrible shape um so hungary is against the formation of blocks it does not that's why it doesn't want to see a 
um, you know, sharp trade barriers that would go like right through it or, or right by it. Connectivity is the name of the game for Hungary. And that's a, that's a word that, that Hungarians use to describe uh, what they're seeking in, in international relations. Um, small country, Central Europe, um, they have to have good relations with the with the powers around them. They're part of the European Union. They're part of NATO. That's their primary market. Um, you know, but uh, if we go toward a, a an era of geopolitical block formation, where the we talked about the liberal imperium a lot earlier, how it seems to be getting um, you know smaller territorially, if you will. But while getting more harsher, while like getting harsher and more, <laughs> while getting harsher and more aggressive, particularly internally, um, you know that's 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 problematic. Um, I think no one really knows what the world is going to look like in ten years. Obviously, that's a glib statement. You're like, no, no one knows, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, but it but it does seem that um, as that liberal imperium is shrinking, as the assumptions behind it prove not to be borne out by reality um, that a country like Hungary has a lot of wisdom to draw on in order to to situate itself. And if you had to frame how American conservatives should look at the example of Hungary, or let's say if Maloney is successful in Italy, you know, any of these European examples, everyone in this town, they're at least used to their hackles would get raised the second you intimate that there's anything to learn from you know those dirty europeans how would you frame in in accessible terms for even a normie con in the united states why they should care about what's happening over there well i think it's important and interesting for a number of reasons first of all anywhere where there are stable conservative governments uh, we should we as Americans should probably try to figure out what the secret to success is. We've talked a little bit, a little bit about that. Um, but second, you know, uh, conservatives in America for the last thirty years have, until at least until the last few years, um, tended to be a kind of slightly conservative or right wing version of the global liberal imperium. You know, where um, the conservatives were obviously engaged and. Uh, Iraq war and the Bush administration was pushing a kind of neoconservative line. Um, and uh, we have to adopt a more practical approach to foreign policy that's not um, aggressively based on you know pushing that ideology in the same way. Um, and so you know as Hungary has been a little bit, uh, ahead of the game on foreign policy. I think it has also been a little bit ahead of the game on thinking strategically in a geopolitical sense. Um, in many, so what does that mean? What, what does thinking strategically in a geopolitical sense mean? Um, it means that they're not guided by a, a, a global ideology that they're trying to advance. They're you know, narrow, narrowly tailored to pursuing their national interest and trying to calculate practically around that um, in uh, you know a rapidly changing environment so within American conservative and and um, and Republican politics again you have like a, a, a heavy back weight of assumptions that America's role in the world is um, you know the same as it has been for the last 30 years that we are we have to maintain, uh, as much dominance as we can. Uh, and so I think we have to begin to adopt a, a more similar practical mindset. What are the key American interests? What, how can it uh, maintain them? Who should it partner with um, in order to do so? And that will require kind of beginning to, to drop these um, assumptions that the global order is going in an ever more liberal direction. So I don't have an exact prescription on what that should look like for the United States, but I think that, um, and, I, and I'm not recommending that, you know, Americans adopt the same view of foreign policy that Hungarians have. That would be completely, that would be nonsensical. We have yeah, a different, we have a different empire. Yeah, exactly. So, Small so I just want to be, want, want to be clear that, uh, 
um, you know, as with when we were talking about the family policy things, I happen to think there are a lot of interesting examples to learn from um, from that, but they're by no means, um, you know, things. There, it's mm-hmm. not like a we shouldn't just copy the exact same policies. Um, and certainly in geopolitics, they're on a completely, you know, the two countries are on a on a different scale. Nevertheless, um, as a country that has had to think non ideologically and practically about the world around it, we have to do more of that. One might even say that the goal is to implement public policy that supports strong families, a sovereign nation, and prosperity for all. That's our mission statement. Fancy that. Fancy <laughs> that. I mean, those are those are the classic goals of uh, political reason or a reason of state. Um, you know, in the European tradition, the I, I talk a lot about the early modern Catholic tradition and um, how it's focused on stability, um, you know, peace, good order. I mean, the classic assumptions of the goals of, of politics uh, are there. They just have to be implemented um, and they can be pursued differently in, in different countries. But we have to get back to them. Other, otherwise, we just won't know what's going on around us. Um you know, Hungary is a tiny country, and therefore it has to know everything that's going on around it. It has to pay attention to trends in Western European politics, has to follow American politics closely. America is a gigantic country, and it's very easy not to pay attention to what's around us. In fact, we don't really pay attention to what's around <laughs> us. In fact, it's hard to even pay attention to everything that's going on in the country because you don't feel it immediately. Mm. Um, And it's even more so when it's Americans like trying to think about what's going on in Europe. I mean, every time I come back to America, people, particularly during the winter, people were asking me like, so is, is everyone like freezing to death in Europe? Like, is there no, like, what's the situation? People have no idea. Um, and that's not good for the formation of mm-hmm. American public policy mm-hmm. because like political policy always has to be oriented toward um, correcting bad tendencies and encouraging mm-hmm. good tendencies. And in America, the tendency is to take our position in the world order for granted, um, not pay close attention to the consequences of our policy because we can absorb a lot of self-inflicted damage. We've reinvented ourselves a bunch of times. Um, so I'm suggesting that we have to put ourselves in that much more practical way of thinking. Where can people keep up with your suggestions on this and many other issues? Well, I'm on Twitter at uh, <laughs> GJ Pappin. Um, so in the next few weeks, I'll be uh, coming into this position at the Hungarian Institute of, of Foreign Affairs, and so um, you know we'll have a rollout of that over the course of the course of the spring. Uh, the institution itself is going through some uh, some changes and reorganization, so we'll have a uh, a larger public profile. I'll be doing my, the, the majority of my work. You know, that's that's like that's my principal thing going forward. Um, you know I co-founded American Affairs. I'm continuing as as deputy there, as deputy editor there. So you can you can find our work there. And um, still writing for the Post Liberal Order Substack, which I co-founded at the end of 2021, as well. So you can follow me at those places. Plenty to learn from all of that, and very excited to see everything you do at. Uh, we're calling it Haifa, Hifa, Hifa. <laughs> we haven't decided on the correct <laughs> pronunciation yet. You know. Well, um, one yes. of those. Um, thank you, Dr. Pappen, for everything you do and uh, for being uh, an inspiration to many of us. Hopefully you enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed taping it. Uh, we'll have to have him back after he's gotten his legs under him at Hifa, Haifa, uh, whatever we're calling it now. Um be sure to follow him on Twitter. Be sure to follow us on social media at ammomentorg. We're even on Blue Sky for just you know CYA reasons in case Twitter completely explodes. Um, but be sure to follow us on Twitter where you can find clips of this show. Be sure to share them around. F- subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, I think 70% of the people who watch on YouTube are not actually subscribed. That's insane to me. Um, be sure to uh, send this to your bosses and your allies in DC if you're working on family policy. Be sure to rate and review this podcast five stars. And in general, keep up with everything we're doing at AmericanMoment.org. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week. 
Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.